Where am I going with this? Hi, I'm Mo, and it is February. Um, I have no idea what day in February it is. It's early on in February. I don't know. I just finished my first book of February and it is Freedom from the Known by Krishnamurti. This is a spirituality... a uh, spirituality philosophy book. That's what it is. Gosh, how to describe this? Okay, it is a uh, gentleman, Krishnamurti, who is from India and he is on a spiritual path. He goes to California and has kind of a revelation and figures out this spirituality slash philosophy of freeing yourself from the trappings of the world and destruction and hate and anything you can think of. The book is only the philosophy. That history kind of aspect that I just mentioned, I learned from just Wikipedia and from researching Krishnamurti and his life. The book itself and the philosophy that it describes reminded me very much at first of Buddhism and the idea that all life is suffering and that there's pain and angst to every aspect of life and that ideally human beings would not be terrible, violent, petty, ambitious, all those things that create pain and fear and suffering. So Buddhism is much more you have to understand that all life is suffering and that you don't want to inflict any more suffering than life already does on anyone. And that's kind of how you look at the world and you treat the world to do the best you possibly can. And in Buddhism, you get kind of reincarnated. And ideally, in each reincarnated life, you atone for the suffering that you caused in the last life and strive to be better. Krishnamurti is definitely not Buddhism, 100% no. He denounces and in his philosophy denounces all religion as part of that suffering and part of that pain and part of that fear. Basically what this book is saying is you have to be so self-aware and live so in the moment of now that you forego all thought and future and past and therefore pain and suffering cannot exist because you are not only practicing nonviolence, you are nonviolent. You are not only practicing kindness, you are kindness. You are not only practicing meditation and observation, you are meditation and observation by being your purest person now. It's very, very complicated <laughs> and it's very, very big concepts and the idea is that you can't think it because of the moment that you think it or think about it you've already created it in the future and in the past you've already put expectations on it that are violence and pain and fear and you've already created it to be a history which is an indoctrination of your past experiences so the only way that you can be this person, this perfect being that is nonviolent, that is not petty, that does not lust, that does not seek pleasure, that does not all those things, is to be purely now, this second, right now. Things that are happening open to everything. And because you are that way, there is no way that you can inflict any kind of pain or violence or pettiness or ambition or love or any of those things on other people. And therefore you are love and you are joy and you are meditation. So it's really hard to get your head around. And it took me a very long time to read it. I mean, not a very long time, but like 10 days, which is kind of a long time. I really, really enjoyed it. I'm really glad I read it. I will have to reread it. I will have to re-explore it. This is a book that I could see myself and I could see anyone who's interested in philosophy and spirituality coming back to over and over again to reread and although it kind of goes against the principles of this spirituality and, and philosophy get more out of each time. I think it's an interesting take on philosophy that I haven't read before and that's the first book that I read in February 2021. It's Golden Hour which is awesome. So it is 
Monday, February 8th, and I have read two more things in February. The first book that I finished was The Hunter by Richard Stark, and this is also known as Parker Book One. So Parker is the main character. He's kind of a mercenary noir figure in this. Not really a detective, more of a criminal. It is a noir written by Richard Stark, who is the pseudonym for Donald Westlake, who is a famous detective, author, and screenwriter. He wrote a lot of the screenplays bringing to movies the detective mystery novels. He's well known for that and this is his Richard Stark pseudonym. My dad, Stephen, gave me this book for Christmas. I finished it in like a day and a half. It's under 200 pages, 198 pages. I just read Raymond Chandler's The Big Sleep and that was the first Raymond Chandler I had ever read and yeah, I like noir. I've always liked noir. I like that kind of mystery. I like that kind of like gritty whatever and The Big Sleep was amazing. And then reading this I was like, oh another noir fun. But this definitely was not anywhere near the quality of Raymond Chandler, anywhere near the quality of The Big Sleep, that novel, and how eloquent and funny and the first of its kind, pinnacle of its genre. Like this is much grittier and darker, violent, sexist, racist, misogynistic. I have read noir, so I know that that's true, and that doesn't generally bother me. Like, I can kind of put it aside. And also it was written in, like, 1962, so you're like, okay. And it's emulating books that were written long, long before that, you know? So you can say, like, okay, it's a time and place. Like, obviously there's problematic things in here, but, like, I can put it aside. But in the beginning of this book, I really struggled with it, and I think, honestly, just being a little bit more aware of reading more diversely, being a little bit more aware of those problematic elements and kind of their repercussions throughout time made this one a little tough. There's definitely like a lot of demeaning scenes toward women. Whereas women in The Big Sleep are very, hmm, they're very like nurtured. They're, they're considered like a great group of people. They're considered like, you know, the fairer sex, the finer sex, obviously prone to deceit and murder and insanity and jealousy and all those things that are kind of implicated in the big sleep. They're also like revered and loved and protected and taken care of. But in The Hunter, women are trash. Women are sex objects. Women are stupid. Women are betrayers. Women are jealous. Women are possessions. It's very obvious that there's a huge demeaning mentality towards women as opposed to a like, oh, women, but we have to protect them because they're wonderful, beautiful creatures. This is more like they're scum, they're slime, they're not good for anything but sex, they're not good for anything. We can use and abuse them, we can manipulate them, we can threaten their lives and force them into impossible situations and then have no responsibility for that. That was really hard to get through. It was much more violent. There wasn't as much of a redeeming kind of overarching thing. Parker is a criminal who gets into a situation that he should know better than to get into with people that he's not sure of and they betray him, they cause his wife to betray him, and then he is seeking revenge throughout this book and he is exacting revenge throughout this book and in the end he hasn't learned anything, he goes back basically to his life. He's a bad guy in this. It was hard to follow an unsympathetic character and it was hard to follow a misogynistic and cruel character. That being said, I still ended up really enjoying this. I, it took me a while to get into it, but once I got into it, it's very fast paced, it's very action packed, dark and gritty, it's a mystery, you're not quite sure what's gonna happen, there's a mob boss kind of element to it. It was fun, it was fast. If you're not in the headspace to be demeaned as a woman, don't read this. Or if you're not in the headspace to read someone demeaning a woman, don't read this. So that was the second book that I read in February. The the third book that I read in February, I had actually started in November. It is Carry On Jeeves by P.G. Woodhouse. It is a beautiful cover. I started reading Carry On Jeeves in November, and this book I had actually read previously on audio. Um, there are two chapters in this book that are not on the audiobook that I had. 
length. I'd listened to it quite a few times, but I've never read any of the stories in this book with my eyeballs. I think that worked and didn't work for me. I was glad to read it. It is hilarious. As with all P.G. Woodhouse and Jeeves and Wisher, I find the writing so silly and outlandish and comical and the timing, I think P.G. Woodhouse's timing between the two characters is so impeccable and I think that in order to fully understand that timing you do have to listen to their work spoken or performed. I love how just silly the writing is and the cadence of the way that Jeeves talks versus the way that Worcester talks. The kind of like ridiculous nature of both their relationship and the scrapes that they get into, just the world that kind of P.G. Woodhouse creates. I read the two chapters that I had never read before. One was about kidnapping an infant, so I can kind of see why they left it out. And the other, I also see why they left out. It was from the perspective of Jeeves, which I have never read before. I haven't read all the P.G. Woodhouse books, and I certainly haven't read all the Jeeves and Wister books. I wonder if there are other books from Jeeves' perspective. I'm sure this is not the last Jeeves and Wister book I will read in 2021. That is the third book that I read in February. Hello, it is February 18th, the last day of Aquarius. I'm an Aquarius, and I wonder what that means for me. I have no idea. I don't know if it means anything for me. I always feel a little, oh, Aquarius is over for the year. Today, I finished Sharp Teeth by Toby Barlow. This is the first book that I have read that was written in verse, and I really liked it. I thought I wasn't going to like it because it was written in verse, but actually I think this was the perfect book to read in verse. This is a book about werewolves. We meet Anthony who takes a job as a dog catcher and has an affinity towards dogs. We have Lark who is a werewolf leader and lawyer and we have a large cast of other characters but Lark and Anthony are kind of our main characters throughout the book. It's kind of about how Lark has a long-term plan for werewolves. He is betrayed and then he's forced to create a war between werewolf packs. It did have a lot of violence in it. Definitely trigger warnings for sexual abuse, violence, animal violence, which I really don't like. But this was kind of like mostly animal and animal violence because they were werewolves and mostly fantastical because they were werewolves. So it didn't bother me as much as it could have, but there were parts in this book that I had to put the book down so that I didn't get upset about the animal violence. There you go, another book read in February. I finally got my library couch cleaned off enough that I can actually sit here, so that's exciting. I finished Thunderstruck, which I believe is the fifth book that I've read in February. I loved it. I've actually read this book before. I didn't know that. I couldn't remember. So when I picked out a different Eric Larson book for my booktube spin, I then found this one and I was like, well, I haven't read this one and this one's older, so I should read this one first. But turns out I've read it before. Like what makes you forget that you read a book? Are you just like reading too much? at that particular time, or you read it too soon after another book, or you were too busy in your life but you were still reading. Like, I'm not really sure what makes one forget a book, but I totally forgot this book. This book is about the invention of and the inventors of the wireless telegram and the scandal of Dr. Crippen who murdered his wife. These two events are happening in parallel times, kind of in parallel places. This book has a lot to do with ocean liners and traveling across the Atlantic and the idea of how much wireless telegrams can help ships at sea. The wireless telegram was a procedure to television, radio, cellular phones, and other wireless communications. And it focuses on Marconi, who is credited with being the true inventor of this innovation. He's an inventor, not a scientist. It's following him, his life, and his kind of trials, tribulations, and also some of his competitors. And then it's also following Dr. Crippen and his wife, and subsequently his affair and murder of his wife. It's really interesting the way Larson juxtaposes these two things and makes both of them equally interesting. I will say that like 
I don't understand what telegraphs are and I don't understand what wireless telegraphy is. It still doesn't make sense to me, like Hertz waves and like all that kind of stuff. Like, I think I'm just one of those people who like, TV is magic, like the cellular phone is magic. I don't know how it works. So a lot of that stuff definitely like went over my head, but it didn't detract from the story at all. Like it didn't take away my enjoyment of reading the book. I'm glad you've read this again. I. I'm not sure why it didn't stick with me, but I'm hoping that this time it will stick with me. I'll catch you when I read something else. Ooh, that is some harsh lighting. Just wanted to pop in and say that I finished another book in February. I finished The Island of Dr. Moreau. I have read this before. This is a reread for me. I love this book. I think most people have a general idea what this is about. It is about a young man who is shipwrecked and rescued by a boat going to a remote island populated by a doctor and his experiments. This is a classic sci-fi. It is by H.G. Wells. I'm not going to talk too much about it, but I did want to read this again because I had read that article about the 1996 Island of Dr. Moreau movie in the What I Ate and What I Read in a Day video. I really enjoyed that article and wanted to revisit this book. I have a read it in a few years, but it's one that I go back to pretty frequently. I've probably read it three or four times. It's always a little bit unfamiliar to me in the actual book because I am so used to the adaptations and the story that I forget some of the actual plot points of the actual book. It was just as good as I remembered it. It is one of those books that although the style of the writing is very old, it is just so captivating. It's also very short. This copy is only 104 pages and it really just sucks you in and you're able to read it in a short amount of time and really be gripped by the story. A lot of this story takes place in like chase form where people are kind of chasing each other and escaping, learning like kind of the horrors of this island uh, through the main character and so you're kind of right there with him, heart pounding. It's like a very stressful book. You're always kind of on the edge, you don't know what's gonna happen and his ordeal really like puts you in that place. That's another book that I read in February. Oh my gosh, this room is becoming a little crazy. It is becoming our plant room and we have our seedlings sprouting in here and I see quite a few seeds sprouting which is exciting. We have our music stuff in here because my husband is currently recording. I film videos in here sometimes and the cats for some reason love to watch the radiator in here. I don't know what's up with that. I have like a weird sneaking suspicion that there's like I don't know, maybe like a family of snakes in there or something, but they come in here and we call it watching TV. So we'll come in here and all three cats will be like staring at the radiator and watching TV. Radiator TV, we call it. I finished a, another book on February. I finished this on February 27th, and this is the first volume of Why the Last Man. It is the first five issues collected into a trade paperback. I see people on booktube calling these bind-ups now. I have read this before. It was published, I believe, in 2002. It follows the story of Yorick, who is a young man. He is an escape artist and magician, and he is faced with an unbelievable task when a unknown plague or pandemic destroys every single creature with a Y chromosome except for him and his pet monkey, Ampersand. This story starts out um, with that event happening in the world and then you are quickly thrown into Yurik's life and what he has to do to find his family, find his girlfriend, and who he meets up with along the way. A lot happens over the storyline but this one is you're just kind of meeting the cast of characters and you're finding out what is going to happen now that there are no men in the world at all. I've read this one many times before and it was just as good reading it again. I probably haven't read it for five or six, maybe ten years, and it was just as good as reading it for the first time. The artwork is very clean and easy to read, easy to understand. Obviously this was a very, very long time ago before we had a worldwide pandemic on our hands right now, so there was something quite poignant about reading it at this time. Besides there being a global plague, there is also a group of 
people who stormed the Capitol, and there are a lot of deaths, and there is a lot of violence. It has a little bit to do with the geopolitical nature of how the world deals with this plague. It has a lot to do with learning who Yurik is and who his family is and who his companions turn out to be. And Yurik is kind of a mixed bag character. Like he's a young kid who kind of thinks he knows everything. So he does get himself into a lot of trouble. And there is like dead bodies and there is like blood. But the violence is more shocking because it's realistic and more shocking because it is very heartfelt and you already feel very connected to this world right away so when people are killed it's quite uh, shocking because it's realistic. So there's a scene where he meets someone who is picking up the dead bodies and so that's quite a gruesome scene and if I read anything else in February I will let you know. It is the end of February and the last book that I read in February was Hellboy Seed of Destruction. So this is Hellboy Volume 1 by Mike Magnola. This was again a bind up or trade paperback featuring the entire story of the Seed of Destruction. This one has the original stories from Hellboy all the way in the back and then the main part of this book is the origin story of Hellboy. Hellboy is a um Hellboy, who was summoned by a crazy Nazi sympathizer. He is summoned to herald the destruction of the world and to bring about the beasts, but he is found by Dr. Broom, taken in and raised as a son, and taught how to be a paranormal investigator. And then we follow another paranormal investigation that he follows that involves Dr. Broom, involves his origin, and involves some giant frog monsters. I love Hellboy. I love Mike Mignola. I love his style. It's so beautiful. He bases a lot of his work on H.P. Lovecraft and myths and legends. He strings in a lot of different cultures, uh, myths and legends. This is like the origin of another one of the characters, but his work is very dark, it's very atmospheric, and it definitely has those gothic vibes. That was the last book that I read in February. The only book that I didn't previously mention was each Peach Pear Plum by Janet and Alan Alberg. This is a children's book that I picked up in a free little library recently. I had this book when I was little and it has really beautiful illustrations and then it also has some very simple rhyming text. I wasn't sure if I had this in my children's book collection so I did pick it up. I'm not sure how I feel about including children's books in my wrap-ups and in my overall numbers and I'm still on the fence and I'm still deciding because when I did put this into Goodreads it obviously went into my Goodreads challenge and it did count as a Goodreads challenge so I'm debating whether I'm gonna leave it there and I'm gonna count it or not I'm not sure a lot of really different things I have like a gothic horror I have a misogynistic noir I have another gothic horror vintage sci-fi I have a few nonfiction, one philosophy spirituality book and one history I have a pandemic plague book I have a lighthearted children's book, a book about werewolves, and a comedy. So all over the place, which I really like. With nonfiction, I'm always surprised when I read a nonfiction every month. This month I happen to read two. This was a DNF that I finished, so I was really happy about that. I was surprised at how much I liked the werewolf book. I thought that the juxtaposition of these three books was really interesting. They all take place in part around the same time. So Thunderstruck mentions H.G. Wells and a lot of Hellboy stuff is kind of written around that same time period. Reading these three books together was really interesting. I kind of read them in succession unknowingly with no intention to do so and I thought that the parallels were really surprising. I read a lot of red books this 
month for some reason. I don't know why. It was a really good reading month, especially for being such a short month and especially for reading more than I read in January. I was quite surprised about that fact. I would say that where my reading kind of fell down this month was in diversity. Almost all of the books that I read were written by white male authors. Uh, most of them were, at least, or they were in part. I think that I beat myself up a little bit more about that because it was Black History Month, but it also occurred to me that why should we celebrate Black History one month a year? I think we should be selling, celebrating Black History and Black creators and Black voices every month. By not reading diverse authors this month, I've only kind of cemented my feeling that I have to include more diverse authors in my general reading. In part because I'm a backlist reader, I think it's going to be a little bit of an uphill battle for me, but I am excited about a couple of books that I've accumulated recently that are by BIPOC authors, and I am excited to get to those. So I am starting to accumulate books with an eye towards that. I think I've been doing that all year, but certainly in February I've been a little bit more aware of it and maybe passed up a book by a white author when I could grab a book by a black author or person of color. It's definitely in my mind, and sometimes you need a stark contrast of not doing the thing that you want to be doing in order to push yourself to do the thing that you want to do. Like to me this month was very obvious that every book I picked up was by a white male and I got excited for other months when I don't pick up only those books. That was my reading month for February. If you've ever read any of the nine books that I've read, please leave me a comment. Also, let me know what your favorite book of February was. Thanks so much. Bye.